Book One, Canto Ten, The Legend of the Knight of Red Cross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Book One. The Legend of the Knight of Red Cross. Canto Ten. Her faithful knight fair Una brings to a house of holiness, where he is taught repentance and the way to heavenly bliss. What man is he that boasts of fleshly might and vain assurance of mortality, which all so soon as it doth come to fight against spiritual foes, yields by and by, or from the field most cowardly doth fly? Now let the man ascribe it to his skill, that through grace hath gained victory. If any strength we have, it is to ill, but all the good is God's, both power and eke will. By that which lately happened, Una saw that this her knight was feeble and too faint, and all his sinews waxen weak and raw, through long imprisonment and hard constraint, which he endured in his late restraint, that yet he was unfit for bloody fight. Therefore to cherish him with diet's daint she cast to bring him in, where he cheer and might, till he recovered had his late decayed plight. There was an ancient house not far away, renowned throughout the world for sacred law and pure unspotted life. So well they say it governed was and guided evermore through wisdom of a matron grave and hoar, whose only joy was to relieve the needs of wretched souls and help the helpless poor. All night she spent in bidding of her beads, and all the day in doing good and godly deeds. Dame Coelia men did her call, as sought from heaven to come, or thither to rise, the mother of three daughters well upbrought in goodly thews and godly exercise, the eldest two most sober, chaste, and wise, Fidelia and Speranza virgins were, though spoused, yet wanting wedlocks, solemn eyes, but fair Carissa to a lovely fear was linked, and by him had many pledges dear. Arrived there, the door they find fast locked, for it was warily watched night and day, for fear of many foes, but when they knocked, the porter opened unto them straight away. He was an aged sire, all hoary grey, with looks full lowly cast, and gait full slow, wont on a staff his feeble steps to stay. Height, humility. They pass in stooping low, for straight and narrow was the way which he did show. Each goodly thing is hardest to begin, but entered in a spacious court they see, both plain and pleasant to be walked in, where does them meet a franklin fair and free, and entertains with comely courteous glee. His name was Zeal, that him right well became, for in his speeches and behaviour he did labour lively to express the same, and gladly did them guide till to the hall they came. There fairly then receives a gentle squire, of mild demeanour and rare courtesy, right cleanly clad in comely sad attire, in word and deed that showed great modesty, and knew his good to all of each degree, height reverence. He then with speeches meet, does fair entreat, no courting nicety, but simply true and eke unfeigned sweet, as might become a squire so great persons to greet and afterwards them to his dame he leads, that aged dame, the lady of the place, who all this while was busy at her beads, which doing she up arose with seemly grace, and towards them full matronly did pace, where when the fairest Una she beheld, whom well she knew to spring from heavenly race, her heart with joy unwanted inly swelled, as feeling wondrous comfort in her weaker eld. And her embracing said, Happy earth! whereon thy innocent feet do ever tread, most virtuous virgin born of heavenly birth, that to redeem thy woeful parents' head from tyrant's rage and ever-dying dread, hast wandered through the world now long a day. Yet seizest not thy weary souls to lead, what grace hath thee now hither brought this way, or do in thy feeble feet unweeting hither stray. Strange thing it is an errant knight to see, here in this place, or any other wight that hither turns his steps. So few there be that choose the narrow path, or seek the right, 
or keep the broad highway and take delight with many rather for to go astray than be partakers of their evil plight then with a few to walk the rightest way o foolish men why haste ye to your own decay thyself to see and tired limbs to rest o matron sage quoth she i hither came and this good knight this way with me addressed led with thy praises and broad blazed fame that up to heaven is blown the ancient dame him goodly greeted in her modest guise and entertained them both as best became with all the curtsies that she could devise nor wanted aught to show her bounteous or wise thus as they gan of sundry things devise lo two most goodly virgins came in place ye linked arm in arm in lovely wise with countenance demure and modest grace they numbered even steps and equal pace, of which the eldest, that Fidelia height, like sunny beams threw from her crystal face, that could have dazed the rash beholder's sight, and round about her head did shine like heaven's light. She was arrayed all in lily-white, and in her right hand bore a cup of gold, with wine and water filled up to the height, in which a serpent did himself enfold, that horror made to all that did behold. But she no wit did change her constant mood, And in her other hand she fast did hold A book that was both signed and sealed with blood, Wherein dark things were writ, hard to be understood. Her younger sister, that Speranza height, Was clad in blue, that her beseemed well. Not all so cheerful seemed she of sight As was her sister, whether dread did dwell Or anguish in her heart is hard to tell. Upon her arm a silver anchor lay, whereon she leaned ever as befell and ever up to heaven as she did pray her steadfast eyes were bent nor swerved other way they seeing una towards her gan wend who them encounters with likely courtesy many kind speeches they between them spend and greatly joy each other well to see then to the night with shamefast modesty they turned themselves at una's meek request and him salute with well beseeming glee who fare them quite as him beseemed best, And goodly gan discourse of many a noble guest. Then Una thus, But she your sister dear, The dear Carissa, Where is she become, Or wants she health, Or busy is elsewhere? Ah, no, said they, But forth she may not come, For she of late is lightened of her womb, And hath increased the world with one son more, That her to see should be but troublesome. Indeed, quoth she, that should her trouble soar, but thanked be God, and her increase so evermore. Then said the aged Coelia, Dear dame, and you, good sir, I wot that of your toil, and labours long, through which ye hither came. Ye both forwearied be, therefore a while I read you rest, and to your bowels recoil. Then called she a groom, that forth him led, into a goodly lodge, and gan despoil of recent arms, and laid in easy bed. His name was meek obedience rightly arred. Now when their weary limbs with kindly rest And bodies were refreshed with due repast, Fair Una gan Fidelia fair request To have her knight into her schoolhouse placed, That of her heavenly learning he might taste, And hear the wisdom of her words divine. She granted, and that knight so much a grace That she taught him celestial discipline, And opened his dull eyes, that light mote in them shine and that her sacred book with blood erit that none could read except she did them teach she unto him disclosed every wit and heavenly documents thereout did preach that weaker wit of man could never reach of god of grace of justice of free will that wonder was to hear her goodly speech for she was able with her words to kill and raise again to life the heart that she did thrill and when she list pour out her larger sprite she would command the hasty sun to stay, Or backward turn his course from heaven's height. Sometimes great hosts of men she could dismay, Dry shod to pass she parts the floods in tway, And eke huge mountains from their native seat She would command themselves to bear away, And throw in raging sea with roaring threat, Almighty God her gave such power and puissance great. The faithful knight now grew in little space, By hearing her, and by her sister's law, to such perfection of all heavenly grace that wretched world he gan for to abhor, and mortal life gan loath as thing for law. Grieved with remembrance of his wicked ways, and pricked with anguish of his sins so sore, 
that he desired to end his wretched days, so much the dart of sinful guilt the soul dismays. But wise Speranza gave him comfort sweet, and taught him how to take assured hold upon her silver anchor as was meet. Else had his sins so great and manifold made him forget all that Fidelia told, in this distressed doubtful agony, when him his dearest Una did behold, disdaining life, desiring leave to die, she found herself assailed with great perplexity, and came to Coelia to declare her smart, who well acquainted with that commune plight which sinful horror works in wounded heart, her wisely comforted all that she might, with goodly counsel and advisement right, and straightway sent with careful diligence, to fetch a leech, that which had great insight in that disease of grieved conscience, and well could cure the same. His name was Patience. Who coming to that soul-diseased knight, could hardly him entreat to tell his grief, which known, and all that gnawed his heavy sprite, well searched, eftsoons he gan apply relief, of salves and medicines, which had passing brief, and thereto added works of wondrous might, by which to ease he him recured brief, and much assuaged the passion of his plight, that he his pain endured, as seeming now more light. But yet the cause and root of all his ill, inward corruption and infected sin, not purged nor healed behind remained still, and festering sore did rankle yet within, close creeping twixt the marrow and the skin, which to extirp he laid him privily, down in a darksome lowly place far in, whereas he meant his corrosives to apply, and with straight diet tame his stubborn malady. In ashes and sackcloth he did array his dainty course, proud humours to abate, and dieted with fasting every day, the swelling of his wounds to mitigate, and made him pray both early and eke late, and ever as superfluous flesh did rot, amendment ready still at hand did wait, to pluck it out with pincers fiery hot, that soon in him was left not one corrupted jot. And bitter penance with an iron whip was wont him once to dispel every day, and sharp remorse his heart did prick and nip, that drops of blood thence like a well did play, and sad repentance used to embay his body in salt water smarting sore, the filthy blots of sin to wash away. So in short space they did to health restore the man that would not live, but erst lay at death's door, in which his torment often was so great, that like a lion he would cry and roar, and rend his flesh, and his own sinews eat. His own dear Una, hearing evermore his rueful shrieks and groanings, often tore her guiltless garments and her golden hair, for pity of his pain and anguish sore. Yet all with patience wisely she did bear, for well she wist his crime could else be never clear. Whom thus recovered by wise patience and true repentance they to Una brought, who joyous of his cured conscience, him dearly kissed, and fairly eke besought himself to cherish, and consuming thought to put away out of his careful breast. By this caressa, late in childbed brought, was waxen strong, and left her fruitful nest, to her fair Una brought this unacquainted guest. She was a woman in her freshest age, of wondrous beauty and of bounty rare, with goodly grace and comely personage, that was on earth not easy to compare. Full of great love, but Cupid's wanton snare, as hell she hated, chast in work and will, her neck and breasts were ever open bare, that I thereof her babes might suck their fill, the rest was all in yellow robes arrayed still. A multitude of babes about her hung, playing their sports that joyed her to behold, whom still she fed, whilst they were weak and young, but thrust them forth still as they waxed old and on her head she wore a tire of gold, adorned with gems and ouches wondrous fair, whose passing price unneath was to be told. And by her side there sate a gentle pair of turtle-doves, she sitting in an ivory chair. The knight and Una entering, fair her greet, and bid her joy of that her happy brood, who them requites with curtsies seeming meet, and entertains with friendly cheerful mood. Then Una her besought to be so good, as in her virtuous rules to school her knight, now after all his torment well withstood, in that sad house of penance, where his sprite had passed the pains of hell and long enduring night. She was right joyous of her just request, and taking by her hand that fairy's son, gan him instruct in every good behest of love and righteousness and well to done, and wrath and hatred warily to shun, 
that drew on men God's hatred and his wrath, and many souls in dollars had fordone, in which when him she well instructed hath, from thence to heaven she teacheth him the ready path, wherein his weaker wandering steps to guide, an ancient matron she to her does call, whose sober looks her wisdom well descried, her name was Mercy, well known over all, to be both gracious and eke liberal, to whom the careful charge of him she gave to lead aright, that he should never fall in all his ways throughout this wild world's wave, that mercy in the end his righteous soul might save. The godly matron by the hand him bears forth from her presence by a narrow way, scattered with bushy thorns and ragged briers, which still before him she removed away, that nothing might his ready passage stay. And ever, when his feet encumbered were, or gan to shrink, or from the right to stray, she held him fast, and firmly did upbear, as careful nurse her child from falling oft does rear. Eft soons unto a holy hospital that was for by the way she did him bring, in which seven beadmen that had vowed all their life to service of high heaven's king, did spend their days in doing godly thing. Their gates to all were open evermore, that by the weary way were travelling, that one sate waiting ever them before, to call in comers by, that needy were and poor. The first of them that eldest was and best of all the house had charge and government, as guardian and steward of the rest. His office was to give entertainment and lodging unto all that came and went, not unto such as could him feast again and double quite, for that he on them spent, but such as want of harbour did constrain, those for God's sake his duty was to entertain. The second was as almoner of the place. His office was the hungry for to feed, and thirsty give to drink, a work of grace. He feared not once himself to be in need, nor cared to hoard for those whom he did breed, the grace of God he laid up still in store, which as a stock he left unto his seed. He had enough, what need him care for more, and had he less, yet some he would give to the poor. The third had of their wardrobe custody, in which were not rich tires nor garments gay, the plumes of pride and wings of vanity, but clothes meet to keep keen cold away, and naked nature seemly to array, with which bare wretched whites he daily clad, the images of God in earthly clay, and if that no spare cloths to give he had, his own coat he would cut, and it distribute glad. The fourth appointed by his office was, poor prisoners to relieve with gracious aid, and captives to redeem with price of brass, from Turks and Sarazins, which them had stayed, and though they faulty were, yet well he weighed that God to us forgiveth every hour much more than that, why they in bands were laid, and he that harrowed hell with heavy star, the faulty souls from thence brought to his heavenly bower. The fifth had charged sick persons to attend, and comfort those in point of death which lay, for them most needeth comfort in the end, when sin and hell and death do most dismay. The feeble soul departing hence away, all is but lost that living we bestow, if not well ended at our dying day. O man have mind of that last bitter throw, for as the tree does fall, so lies it ever low. The sixth had charge of them now being dead, in seemly sort their courses to engrave, and deck with dainty flowers their bridal bed, that to their heavenly spouse both sweet and brave they might appear, when he their souls shall save, the wondrous workmanship of God's own mould, whose face he made all beasts to fear, and gave all in his hand, even dead we honour should. Our dearest God me grant, I dead be not defiled. The seventh now, after death and burial done, had charged the tender orphans of the dead, and widow's aid, lest they should be undone. In face of judgment he their right would plead, nor aught the power of mighty men did dread, in their defence, nor would for gold or fee be won their rightful causes down to tread. And when they stood in most necessity, he did supply their want, and gave them ever free. There when the elfin knight arrived was, the first and chiefest of the seven whose care was guests to welcome, towards him did pass, where seeing mercy, that his steps up bare, and always led to her with reverence rare, he humbly louted in meek lowliness, and seemly welcome for her did prepare, for of their order she was patroness, Alvi Carissa were their chiefest founderess. There she a while him stays himself to rest, that to the rest more able he might be, 
during which time in every good behest and godly works of alms and charity she him instructed with a great industry shortly therein so perfect he became that from the first unto the last degree his mortal life he learned had to frame in holy righteousness without rebuke or blame thenceforward by that painful way they pass forth to an ill that was both steep and high on top whereof a sacred chapel was and eke a little hermitage thereby wherein an aged holy man did lie that day and night said his devotion nor other worldly business did apply his name was heavenly contemplation of god and goodness was his meditation great grace that old man to him given had for god he often saw from heaven's height all were his earthly eye both blunt and bad and through great age had lost their kindly sight yet wondrous quick and persant was his sprite as eagle's eye that can behold the sun that hill they scale with all their power and might that his frail thighs nigh weary and for don gun fail but by her help the top at last he won there they do find that godly aged sire with snowy locks adown his shoulders shed as hoary frost with spangles doth attire the mossy branches of an oak half dead each bone might through his body well be read and every sinew seen through his long fast for not he cared his carcass long unfed his mind was full of spiritual repast and pined his flesh to keep his body low and chaste who when these two approaching he espied at their first presence grew a grieved sore that forced him lay his heavenly thoughts aside and had he not that dame respected more whom highly he did reverence and adore he would not once have moved for the night they him saluted standing far afore who well them greeting humbly did requite and asked to what end they clomb that tedious height what end quoth she could cause us take such pain but that same end which every living wight should make his mark high heaven to attain is not from hence the way that leadeth right to that most glorious house that glistereth bright with burning stars and everlasting fire whereof the keys are to thy hand be hight by wise fidelia she doth thee require to show it to this knight according his desire thrice happy man said then the father grave whose staggering steps thy steady hand doth lead and shows the way his sinful soul to save who better can the way to heaven areed than thou thyself who was both born and bred in heavenly throne where thousand angels shine thou dost the prayers of the righteous seed present before the majesty divine and his avenging wrath to clemency incline yet since thou bidst thy pleasure shall be done then come thou man of earth and see the way that never yet was seen a fairy son that never leads the traveller astray but after labours long and sad delay bring them to joyous rest and endless bliss but first thou must a season fast and pray till from her bands the sprite assoiled is and have her strength recurred from frail infirmities that done he leads him to the highest mount such one as that same mighty man of god that blood-red billows like a walled front on either side departed with his rod till that his army dry foot through them yod dwelt forty days upon where writ in stone with bloody letters by the hand of god the bitter doom of death and baleful moan he did receive while flashing fire about him shone or like that sacred hill whose head full high adorned with fruitful olives all around is as it were for endless memory of that dear lord who oft thereon was found for ever with a flowering girl and crowned or like that pleasant mount that is for i through famous poets verse each where renowned on which the thrice three learned ladies play their heavenly notes and make full many a lovely lay from thence far off he unto him did show a little path that was both steep and long which to a goodly city led his view whose walls and towers were builded high and strong of pearl and precious stone that earthly tongue cannot describe nor wit of man can tell too high a ditty for my simple song the city of the great king hight it well wherein eternal peace and happiness doth dwell as he thereon stood gazing he might see the blessed angels to and fro descend from highest heaven in gladsome company and with great joy into that city wend as commonly as friend does with his friend whereat he wondered much and gan inquire what stately building durst so high extend her lofty towers unto the starry sphere and what unknown nature therein peopled were fair knight quoth he jerusalem that is the new jerusalem that god has built for those to dwell in that are chosen his 
his chosen people purged from sinful guilt with precious blood which cruelly was spilt on cursed tree of that unspotted lamb that for the sins of all the world was kilt now are they saints in all that city sam more dear unto their god than younglings to their dam till now said then the knight i weened well the great cleopolis where i have been in which that fairest fairy queen doth dwell the fairest city was that might be seen and that bright tower all built of crystal clean panthea seemed the brightest thing that was but now by proof all otherwise i ween for this great city that does far surpass and this bright angel's tower quite dims that tower of glass most true then said the holy aged man yet is cleopolis for earthly frame the fairest piece that i beholden can and well the seems all knights of noble name that covet in the immortal book of fame to be eternized that same to haunt and do in their service to that sovereign dame that glory does to them for guerdon grant for she is heavenly born and heaven may justly vaunt and thou fair imp sprung out from english race however now a compted elfin's son well worthy does thy service for her grace to aid a virgin desolate for done but when thou famous victory has won and high amongst all knights has hung thy shield thenceforth the suit of earthly conquest shun and wash thy hands from guilt of bloody field for blood can naught but sin and wars but sorrows yield then seek this path that i to thee presage which after all to heaven shall be send then peaceably thy painful pilgrimage to yonder same Jerusalem do bend where is for thee ordained a blessed end for thou amongst the saints whom thou dost see shalt be a saint and thine own nation's friend and patron thou saint george shalt call it be saint george of merry england the sign of victory unworthy wretch quoth he of so great grace how dare i think such glory to attain these that have it attained were in like case quoth he as wretched and lived in like pain but deeds of arms must i at last be fain and ladies love to leave so dearly brought what need of arms where peace doth i remain said he and battles none are to be fought as for loose loves they are vain and vanish into naught o oh, let me not quoth he then turn again back to the world whose joys so fruitless are but let me here for aye in peace remain or straightway to that last long voyage fare that nothing may my present hope impair that may not be said he nor mayst thou yet forgo that royal maid's bequeathed care who did her cause into thy hand commit till from her cursed foe thou have her freely quit then shall i soon quoth he so god me grace abet that virgin's cause disconsolate and shortly back return unto this place to walk this way in pilgrim's poor estate but now a read old father why of late did thou behight me born of english blood whom all a fairy's son do nominate that word shall i said he a virgin good since to thee is unknown the cradle of thy brood for well i wot thou springs from ancient race of saxon kings that have with mighty hand in many bloody battles fought in place i reared their royal throne in britain land and vanquished them unable to withstand from thence a fairy thee unwitting left there as thou slept in tender swaddling band and her base elfin brood there for thee left such men do changelings call so changed by fairies theft thence she thee brought into this fairy land and in an heaped furrow did thee hide where thee a ploughman all unweeting fond as he is toilsome team that way did guide and brought thee up in ploughman's state to bide whereof jorgus he thee gave to name till pricked with courage and thy forces pride to fairy court thou camest to seek for fame and prove thy recent arms as seems thee best became o holy sire quoth he how shall i quite the many favours i with thee have found that has my name and nation read aright and taught the way that does to heaven bound this said adown he looked to the ground to have returned but dazed were his eyne through passing brightness which did quite confound his feeble sense and too exceeding shine so dark are earthly things compared to things divine at last when as himself he gan to find to unabak he cast him to retire who him awaited still with pensive mind great thanks and goodly meed to that good sire he hence departing gave for his pains hire so came to una who him joyed to see 
and after little rest gan him desire of her adventure mindful for to be so leave they take of Crelia and her daughters three end of canto ten book one the legend of the knight of red cross